Thank you very much. But in actual fact, there's been a terrible mistake. It wasn't Venables, it was Terry Wogan. <laughs> it's nice to be here and nice to be back in uh, this hall. I forget how long ago it was that I was here, but it was for the festival, the book uh, festival that I came to speak here last time. And um, it's good to be back again. Thank you for inviting me. What I would like to do tonight is divide what I have to say into two parts. First, speak personally about the experience of living for about four and a half years in solitary confinement and describe something of that experience and how one survives mentally and physically and spiritually in a situation of that kind. And then I'd like to move and discuss one way in which that particular experience enabled me to concentrate more fully in uh, an aspect of social involvement regarding the homeless. And those are the two things that I'll concentrate on this evening. Um, let me tell you a story to begin with. Uh, recently I met uh, John McCarthy and Brian Keenan and Jill Morrell. We've met many times, but we've never met together to discuss our experiences in uh, captivity. And we met with Sue McGregor to do the program, The Reunion. Some of you may have heard it. Um, we had a chance to talk together, and John reminded me of a story. He and Brian were kept together for many years. Uh, they were chained together in the same cell, quite different than myself. I was kept in solitary. And over a period of time, the food deteriorated. It was never good, but it became very, very poor indeed. And they complained. And they complained, and they complained, and nothing happened. And then after about six months, the leader of the kidnapping group came to see them and he asked them what they were getting and they told him and the group were not entirely without honor and he said well that's something wrong there so he said I'll look into this so he examined the situation and discovered it was the same old trick that had been practiced across the generations. Money had been given to the guard, the guard had pocketed half the money and used the other half uh, to buy food. Consequently, the food was appalling. And so, they took the guard out and shot him. That was there. Are the uh, caterers listening this evening? Oh. <laughs> no, I think they've gone, mercifully. <laughs> the simple point, of course, being that if a man, a young guard, would uh, deceive on that simple matter of food, then someone would come along perhaps and offer him a bribe of a more substantial sum and he might well give away the whole organization. But there's another point to that too, and that is that it's very easy, very easy to get into a terrorist organization. It's very difficult to leave. Impressionable young men, age of 17, 18, 19, who are highly idealistic, who have uh, visions of what perhaps an Islamic society ought to be, are persuaded that the only way in which they can bring about 
change is to join such a group, are easily persuaded to enter. But as we see in group after group after group, we've seen it in the Middle East, we've seen it in Northern Ireland, it's exceptionally difficult for them to leave. And I'm afraid that, uh, and I'm straying slightly from my subject now, but working as I do constantly in the area today of, of terrorism and hostage taking, I'm afraid that some of the policies that our government have followed in recent years have not helped the situation at all. Guantanamo Bay, extraordinary rendition. The taking of people and the bypassing of due process have actually been fatal policies. We perhaps have not gone at those policies with full force, but we've known about them and we've acquiesced. And that is no way to deal with the problem of terrorism. Once you start to take shortcuts with the law, once you put, start to put the law to one side, you open the floodgates and you give an excuse uh, to terrorist leaders to say, well, look how the West behaves. Why shouldn't we? But I say, I digress. I was taken captive uh, as a result of uh, political duplicity. And I found myself in an underground cell in Beirut. It was a very unusual sort of place. The walls were completely tiled, and when I first entered that cell, my blood ran cold because I knew that such places were tiled as in such places people are tortured and it's easy to clean up such places after such events. I wondered what I was going to face there. There were three or four cells deep underground beneath a car park, which was beneath an apartment block. And it was quite eerily silent. There was a, a simple shower, a generator, totally independent of the main building. The only noise came when the generator was switched on to supply power, which it did occasionally. But most of the time, one was in darkness or with a, with a candle. And there were people in other cells. To this day, I know not who they were. And often I have the chilling thought that perhaps there might still be people there today whom I know not and who've been abducted and languish in those underground cells in Beirut. The Lebanese gulag, as Terry Anderson, the American journalist who was also captured, as he once uh, commented. I was moved from underground, sometimes above ground in a bomb building, where metal shutters were put against the wall, and for 23 hours, 50 minutes a day, I was chained by the hand and feet to the wall, slept on the floor, had no books or papers for over three years, no contact with the outside world, no one to speak with, uh, except a cursory word with the guard when the guard came in, and there was nothing. Now, in the situation of extreme isolation, extreme uh, separation from the world and from normal stimulation, in a situation of that kind, of course, you begin to worry about survival. Because you see your skin turn white because of no natural light. You lose muscle tone because there's no exercise that you can do other than the exercise that you can do on the end of a chain. My beard, which had been black, grew long and white. I had no haircut or no cutting for the beard. 
for a long, long time. And an abscess developed under a tooth and there was no medicine apart from aspirin. And in that type of situation, I remember thinking to myself, my goodness, you're growing old before your time. Now we're all getting older and most people, vast majority, managed to grow old gracefully. But it seemed to me in that situation as though even that was now being denied me. And I wondered as I saw my physical body begin to deteriorate at an unacceptable rate, would I deteriorate mentally? Would I deteriorate spiritually? Would I in fact disintegrate as a person? I'd seen or read as a boy stories of people who'd been kept in strict isolation for years and when eventually they were released they came out blinking into the light of day gibbering because they'd lost the power of speech and it seemed from those stories that they'd lost their wits also and I used to think to myself is that an inevitable a consequence of being kept in strict solitary confinement, strict isolation. Does it necessarily mean that you will deteriorate in that way? And I had to find a way of actually surviving <clears throat> through the experience. And now I was fortunate in a number of ways because I had always been someone who had read, I'd read widely, and I had committed to memory uh, certain poems and prose works, and I had a store of memory, of good memory, and I was able to call on that memory. Now language is obviously something that is absolutely critical to identity. One of the reasons why I am myself so keen on preserving good language, uh, on teaching language properly, on not letting language deteriorate uh, and uh, become scrappy. It's no uh, coincidence to my mind that when, unfortunately, some individuals begin to suffer from Alzheimer's, or related illnesses, they begin to lose uh, the power of, of, of memory and of speech and eventually of identity. They are related intimately. And language, like good music, has a capacity to breathe a certain harmony into the soul. And one of the things that one is afraid of in a situation of extremity, as I've already said, is that you will disintegrate within. And all the time, you strive to find some degree of inner harmony. I began to write in my head. The book uh, which I wrote in my head, Taken on Trust, which was eventually put on paper when I was elected to a fellowship in Cambridge, but I wrote that in my head without pencil and paper because I had no pencil and paper. And I utilized my mind to begin to write so and begin to utilize memory and call on memory. Someone once said to me, when you're in a situation of extremity, allow your body to come to your aid and it will. It was um, the late Carl Jung, the Swiss psychotherapist, who wrote words to that effect many, many years ago. And I had read them as a young man. I thought I knew what he meant. But in that experience, I discovered what he meant. People say to me, did you have dreams? Did you have nightmares? The answer is no, I didn't have nightmares. I had dreams. But the dreams were actually amusing. It was as though 
the bleakness of the surroundings were compensated for by the dreams which took me out of myself and took me into areas of humor. It was an example of my body coming to my aid. But then I also discovered what was very necessary. In that situation, the situation of extremity, you are kicked around. You are pushed around from pillar to post. Someone will come in in the middle of the night, undo the shackles and take you and beat you on the soles of the feet with cables so you can't walk for a week in order to try and extract information from you that certainly you don't have. One of the reasons why I am absolutely appalled at the fact that any nation that calls itself a civilized nation can actually engage in torture. It is appalling. Torture is not in any way a, an effective means of getting information. And even if it were, it ought to be outlawed. There is no way for any civilized nation to behave. And I say that as someone who has experienced both physical and mental torture and has been subject also to a mock execution. It is no way for any civilized nation to behave. But in that uh, situation of extremity, I discovered that what one has to do is to somehow begin to find your own center, your own identity. Now in normal life, our identity is given to us in so many different ways. Uh, our profession, headmaster, musician, father, director, whatever. It's there. When you're in isolation, when you're in solitary confinement, you are just kicked around as being nobody. And so there is no one to give you that identity. You have to begin to find it for yourself. And one way in which I discovered one can come to terms with that is to take an inner journey. Now, I'd said to myself, you've taken many, many exterior journeys in your life. Now is a chance to take an inner journey <clears throat> and to begin to know yourself more completely. That's a dangerous process, of course, because any human being who examines themselves critically will discover, any human being will discover, that they're a composite mixture of what one might call light and dark. Some people use the terms good and evil. I would use the terms light and dark. A composite mixture. The danger when you are by yourself is that you will be obsessed with the dark side, that you become depressed and fall into deep depression. And somehow what you have to do in that situation is somehow recognize the very simple fact that you're just an ordinary human being like everybody else. You are that composite mixture. And the way to deal with the conflicting nature that you see within yourself is not to suppress the dark and say, I'm walking totally in the light, but somehow to begin to find again that key word, some degree of inner harmony. It's a lifetime process, of course, but it's a process that if you can follow it in that situation of extremity, then it can be an aid to enabling you to survive. Why is it, you know, we might ask, that when some people who have so given themselves commendably to their occupation during life and then come to the point of retirement and suddenly find that life is empty. And how, why is it that some people come to retirement and 
well, only managed to survive for a few years. It's as well, in my view, to give attention to that inner life from which uh, and within which there are untold uh, depths and as many interesting depths as there are in the external world. Now you can cloak all what I've said, and some people do, in religious language. I don't myself. But I do regard it as being one way in which I was able to survive. But, as I said a moment or two ago, I was fortunate. I had a background of reading. I had a background of some understanding. And I certainly had plenty of time uh, to follow the pathway that I'm now just expressing. Many people <coughs> are not in that fortunate position. I was eventually uh, moved away from the particular cell I was in and put in a cell next to other hostages. And it was at that point, this was after about four and a half, four and three quarter years. And for the first time then, I got uh, a small radio. I can't tell you what that meant to suddenly find that I was now in contact with a world that I'd left almost five years ago. And I couldn't, uh, it took me a while to begin to catch up. I always remember the first night I got that radio. I balanced it on the metal bar to which my chain was attached, or one of my chains was attached. And it was the first night of the proms. And they were playing the dream of Garantius. And I sat there and listened to this wonderful music of Elgar. Here, somewhere, I didn't know where I was, somewhere in Beirut. And the music was coming across from the Royal Albert Hall in London. And it was the first music I'd heard in years. When I came out eventually, my doctor at the time took me to lunch and I told him that story. He said, oh, I was there that night and my daughter was in the choir. And I thought, well, how remarkable that one could be linked across the world through the medium of the radio and what comfort and sustaining support that little radio gave me in those last years. Of course, after when I came out, it was then I met Rory. Because I was terrified when I had that radio that when the batteries ran out, I'd suddenly be plunged back into total isolation. And frankly, I'd had enough of total isolation. They did, in fact, renew the batteries. But when I got out, I went to Africa, back to Uganda for a period of time <clears throat> to see my former colleague with whom I'd worked and whom I'd trained many years previously, living now in the bush. He had a radio and it was the usual complaint. His children had it on in the daytime when he was working, came back at night and the batteries were flat. He hadn't the heart himself to do what Rory suggested and take them out and put them in his pocket. But I took him a wind-up radio. And he was linked once again with the world because I knew how that man felt. I knew what it means to be isolated. He was an educated man. And without the radio, stuck in the bush in the middle of Uganda, he'd be totally cut off from what was happening in the world. And he didn't want to be. There are many, many stories I could tell you about those years of captivity. But let me 
move to the second bit of what I want to say tonight. In that time when I came out, first of all, I was elected to a fellowship at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, and I went there and lived there in the week and went home at weekends, and I began to put on paper that which I'd written in my head in those years, and that produced eventually the book, Taken on Trust. But after a period of time, I went to see the embryonic beginning of something that, with which now I've been involved ever since I left captivity. And that was a new project for the homeless which was being started in Cambridge. Robert Runcie, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, the late Archbishop of Canterbury, for whom I used to work, took me there and he said, I think you will appreciate and understand this particular project. We went to a windswept area about 10 miles outside Cambridge and there were a couple of caravans and a couple of buildings and a young uh, married couple. Paul had just left the police force because he said he got fed up of locking people up and wanted to do something to help people be rehabilitated. And Jane, his wife, was a nurse and was going along with him. And this was the beginning of a project known as Emmaus. I'd never heard of it. Emmaus was founded in France following World War II. It was founded by a remarkable Frenchman, the Abbe Pierre, and he was appalled at the situation facing the homeless in France after the war. And so he began this movement, which did not come to England until 1992. This concept is this, that someone who's been homeless will come into a community, and community is essential. They receive a good room with an ensuite bathroom. So immediately they're treated with respect. Not a DOS house, 25 people in the community. They will be expected to leave behind the dole. They will also be expected to work on premises according to their capacity. On premises there will be uh, a warehouse where goods are collected, often second-hand goods or goods from houses which have been cleared, electrical goods which are being renovated, there will be workshops and there will be a large store where these goods can be sold so that the community can begin to become self-supporting. Now the importance of this is first of all that when you're on the streets begging as many are, you are in a dependent relationship. You lose your social interactive skills. I, I lost them myself. It took me a year before I could begin to communicate uh, more effectively with people after being in that position of isolation. You are actually treated when you're on the streets. Yes, sometimes you're treated kindly, sometimes you're dismissed, but you lose your sense of self-worth and you begin to lose your identity and you begin to be pushed around from pillar to post and you're told to pick yourself up and get yourself together and many people who find themselves on the streets or a good number do not have the background uh, to draw on to develop that inner life many have been into from difficult situations many young people have been kicked out of home by a stepfather who no longer wants them. And so as soon as they get to the age of 15 or 16, out you go. Where? Nowhere. On the streets. The important thing about the Emmaus principle is it enables people to regain their self-respect through engaging in meaningful work and through beginning to interact in new ways with the public to begin to develop social skills which equip them to move back into life. 
and the mayor's community costs a lot to set up, normally, not always, simply to get the buildings there. After three or four years, it will become self-supporting, so it's a good business model. And eventually, some people will stay for a while, some people will regain their dignity and move on into normal life. That always happens. We now have 19 such communities in the country and another 15 coming along. And the nearest one here in the west is what is hardly considered to be the west of England, but is in, um, in Bristol. That's the nearest one, I think, to yourselves here. But it's important, the basic point of what I'm trying to get across is this. We cannot and should not expect some of the social problems that face us today to be resolved simply by handouts or simply by the government. If we're going to do something in our communities, we have to take the initiative ourselves and we have to begin to transform our communities and it can be done. Someone mentioned uh, earlier on this evening, Michael Young, remarkable man who had that belief that individuals can bring about significant change if they wish. He was 300% right. It can be done. It is not easy, but it can be done. It is a disgrace that many of our towns are littered with people who hang in shop doorways. I can tell you, as you will well know, I don't need to tell you, it is very, very easy to slip down. It is very, very difficult to get back and to be rehabilitated. And so here, this is not a charity. A mess is, in fact, a registered charity. But it's not a charity in the old sense of the word that the charity is always asking for money. It's a good model that enables people to get back on their feet and to become self-supporting. The University of Cambridge did a study of Emmaus Cambridge and worked out that each community was saving the local taxpayer some £600,000 a year. Previously, those homeless men and a few women had been a cost on the taxpayer and been taking money. Now, they were generating income and also fulfilling a useful social role because the whole community was actually serving the wider community. It is a model that works. To go back for a moment before concluding to my own experience of those years, there were not, uh, as I've been talking in a rather serious and sombre way, there were not many funny things that happened, but let me tell you one of the funny things. People have said, what did you miss most in those years? Was it food? Well, it wasn't. Was it, uh, well, family, yes, I miss family, I miss friendship, I miss freedom. But apart from the obvious, I miss books. I've been a reader all my life, and to be deprived of books for years, you know, to sit on the floor and to have nothing was a particular hardship. And I used to plead with the guards to bring me books, and they wouldn't. Eventually, after some years, I met a kindly guard, and he said, I'll try and get you a book. But he had two problems. He couldn't read English, and he couldn't be seen to go into a bookshop and buy English books because that would have drawn attention to himself. So he worked through a series of cutouts. Someone went into a shop, got a book, passed it down the line, and eventually it came to him and it came to me. One day he came into the cell, and when anyone came in, I had to pull a blindfold over my eyes. And he dropped a book by my side. He said, there you are, there's a book for you. And I said, oh, thank goodness, after all these years, and when he went out of the cell, I took the blindfold off, picked up the book, and laughed out loud. Unknown to himself, he brought me a book entitled 
great escapes. <laughs> escapes from prison camp in World War II. <laughs> Things went from bad to worse. About a few weeks later, he told me, read slow, read slow, read slow. Very difficult thing to do, but I did my best. Uh, about a couple of weeks later, he came back with another book. This time, it was, believe it or not, a manual of breastfeeding. <laughs> Wasn't even illustrated. I mean, it was... <laughs> well, as the father of three daughters and one son, twin daughters, you know, my wife had breastfed one, I bottle fed the other night after night. I, the last thing I wanted was a manual of breastfeeding. When he brought me the ubiquitous Dr. Spock, baby and childcare, I thought, now here, something's wrong. I mean, how do I, sitting in this cell, goodness knows where, uh, get someone at the other end of a chain who's obviously got fastened on the baby and childcare shelf, how do I get them off that shelf onto something more interesting? Now, can you puzzle that out? I sat there and I tried to work this out. And then I said, can I have a pencil and paper, please? He said, yes, just for a moment or so. I only had a pencil and paper twice. Once when I was asked to write a letter because I was, they told me I was going to be executed and I could write a letter to my family, which I did. <laughs> but as you can see, I wasn't executed, so there we are, that was that. And the other time was this occasion. So he brought me a, a pencil and paper and sitting on the floor, looking beneath the blindfold, I drew the picture of a penguin. As if you see that on the front of a book, buy it. Be a good book. And you know, it worked. Uh, the trademark, the Penguin Books. And again, a couple of weeks later, I got a book. It was, again, uh, aptly titled, As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning by Laurie Lee. <laughs> but a book that I had read previously, but it was wonderful to get a good book. And thereafter, I did get a whole series of Penguin books. You know, there's one simple point to be taken from that, isn't there? Don't, you know, deal lightly with the trademark. You know, the trademark, the symbol, has the capacity to go across boundaries, cultural boundaries, language boundaries. I always thought how stupid um, British Airways were when they started to paint the tails and get rid of the traditional imprinted trademarks. Clear, they knew nothing about the power of the symbol, or very little. And uh, that particular lesson has stayed with me ever since. I'll conclude by saying this, that we do live in a world where there is enormous suffering. We are relatively fortunate in this country, as Rory has so clearly indicated in his very interesting and excellent address. We, do we are very fortunate, but we do live in our own country with a lot of suffering too. And suffering is no respecter of persons. It lands on people regardless of their social status or how they have behaved, it's there. And we can't explain it. We can only say, really, if we're honest with ourselves, that is how life is. Suffering is no respect of persons, it's a part and parcel of life. But one thing I think I can say with a reasonable degree of confidence is this, that suffering need not destroy. It is possible to take situations of suffering and from them to enable something creative to emerge. If you look back in history, you'll see many of the creative works come from situations of considerable suffering and great creativity has emerged. That does not mean for one moment to say we need to look for suffering. We don't. It will find us. 
But when it does, we need not fall into despair because almost without it, exception, it can be changed and utilized creatively. And perhaps one of the greatest things we can do in our lives and in our occupation is not only learn how to deal with that in our own lives, but how to make this world and our place and part in it, in this part and this corner of England, a place where at least we are building a community, a society that has a degree of wholeness about it that is wholesome and a place that we can truly call home. Home, uh, something, of course, that today means even more to me now than it ever did before I had that experience of suffering. Thank you very much.